lockdowns, mass surveillance, forever war. Is this still the land of the free? It will be again. I'm Eric Brakey, and it's time to free America now. Because an idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Hello and welcome everyone to a very special episode of Free America Now. I am your host and renegade statesman, Eric Brakey. This is a Young Americans for Liberty production. And this episode is one of our weekly video episodes that we are releasing on all Young Americans for Liberty social media platforms. But of course, the audio version of this episode will also be available on your favorite podcasting app. If you have not yet subscribed on your favorite podcasting app to Free America Now, be sure to do that. You don't want to miss out on all the great Liberty content we are releasing five days a week and then a few bonus episodes here and there like this one. So I am so pleased to welcome to this show Spike Cohen. He is uh, a really someone who's become a, a very big influencer in the liberty movement, someone with a very big voice talking about a lot of the important issues. He was the vice presidential candidate on the Libertarian Party ticket in 2020, and he is still to this day making waves, spreading the message, and today I'm glad to welcome him to be on the show with me. Hey, Spike, welcome to Free America Now. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me on, man. I look forward to it. Hey, well, hey, it's my pleasure. This is actually the first time that you and I have ever spoken to each other. Yes. So <laughs> it's a it's a real pleasure. I know a lot of folks here in Young Americans for Liberty, when they heard that uh, you were going to be on, they, they, they told me to let you know they all say hello. So everyone at Young Americans for Liberty says hello. You got a lot of fans here in the- uh, That's great. The- <laughs> hello, all Young Americans for Liberty. I used to be a Young American. Now I'm just for Liberty. Well, I'm still an American. <laughs> I'm just not young anymore. Yeah, I'm pushing it myself. I'm 33. I'm not sure how much longer I can put that young part uh, in my uh, description of myself. About six years. About About six six years. years. Yeah. You know, it's 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 always interesting how like the different parties like um, uh, classify what is young. Like I think like the young Democrats, it's 35 is the cutoff. Young Republicans, Mm -hmm. it's 40 though. I think we can all kind of imagine imagine why. I don't know what the Libertarian Party. There's like a young libertarians like group. I don't know if there is one. I guess I guess maybe there's it would be like half the party. So (laughs) yeah, I'm I'm not sure if there's a strict cutoff. I just know I'm not young anymore. So you know, the libertarians typically were about sort of the personal subjective experience. I personally am no longer young. Have not been for at least about a year. Uh, Geriatric millennial very well describes me. Um, I am a, uh, I'm an MAL. I'm a middle-aged American for Liberty. So I'm, I'm good yeah. for that. I guess if you, if you hit the constitutional age where you can run on a presidential ticket, yes, you're probably no downhill. longer qualify as a young American. It's all downhill so. from there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hey, I'm really, really glad to have you. And, um, well, we could just, we could just like hop right in. I, um, sure. I, I wrote down a few questions, but I, as I was saying before, I like to keep it conversational, but how about we just start with how did you get involved? How did you discover the cause of liberty? What got you involved to the point where you decided to go from, you know, not just being someone who, you know, tacitly agrees with these ideas, but you 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 got out there, you you went so far as to, you know, you ran, you ended up becoming the uh the the vice presidential candidate on the LP ticket mm-hmm. in 2020. Yeah. What what's your journey? How, how in the world did you get into this crazy world? So what got me into being a libertarian in the first place was people like Matt Kibbe and Dr. Paul and uh, and a few others who really just disabused me of my neoconservatism. I I I was a uh, I was a young American, but not for liberty. Um, uh, (laughs) Back in uh, in 2001, when 9/11 happened, I fully bought into the government and corporate media narrative about 9/11 that the terrorists hated us for our freedoms and that we needed to you know bomb the world to show them our peaceful ways and spread democracy at, at gunpoint and appointing puppet regimes. It sounds ridiculous saying it now, but I believed it. I 100% believed it. I believe the lie oh, yeah. that bipartisan- A lot of us fell for it. I f- good. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. A lot of us fell for it. I, I, I fell for it. I fell for it too. When you say your story, it sounds a lot like mine. You know, I remember being a just a young person, you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, watching yep. Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity and believing like, 
wow, yes. you know, we were attacked. We got to go over there and we're going to spread democracy. And, you know, this is what I often say is like that one of the, the sad things about it is, you know, I know so many good people who, who bought into all that. They preyed on our virtues, telling us that if yep. you loved America, if you loved freedom, we needed to go over there and exactly. kill a bunch of people who had nothing to do with it. No one had any, that had nothing to do with it while partnering with people who did have something to do with it. And right. it, it took, you know, hearing basically Dr. Paul and, and Matt Kibbe and a few others, they predicted what was going to happen. And then it happened that way. You know, we weren't greeted as liberators. Uh, it didn't get easier as it went on. It became a slog. You know, we started finding out about the lies that were told. And that really made me kind of reexamine everything I had been told about government. And, you know, you read some Bastiat, you read some uh, Spooner, you read a little Sterner, you read some Rothbard and Mises, and before you know it, you're a libertarian. Now, down what got me into, <laughs> yeah, down that, down that, that neoconservative to, to libertarian rabbit hole that many of us have found ourselves in. And um, so what got me into the activism was I had always been a business owner. The reason that pretty much no one had heard of me up until about two, three years ago is because I was always a, a small business owner. That was my thing. I was growing a small business. I was very successful with it. And that was pretty much what I was going to do. I was going to chase money until I died. And then, uh, and then one day I woke up and the right side of my body was numb. Fast forward two years later, and I was told after many years of, of testing and uncertainty that I did have multiple sclerosis. And when we had the conversation with my doctor about my treatment options, they said, long story, I'm trying to, you know, dive this into a very small conversation, but long story short, they said, uh, your treatment options, the goal of your treatment is to slow down the progression of your MS so that it's not much different than the aging process. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, up until that point, I was in my early thirties and I, I was in that kind of mindset of, you know, well, yeah, we're all going to die and we're all going to get older, but that's later. And I realized, no, it's not, it's coming. And, and I, and I, in that moment, I realized everything that I, that I had been fighting for up until this point didn't really matter anymore. I'd reached a point where I didn't need to work to make money. I was going to be comfortable even if I didn't work. And I thought, well, what matters the most is what kind of world am I leaving behind? I care about liberty. I care about freedom, but do I want to focus on money or do I want to focus on what actually matters? And long story short, that got me to, uh, to activism. I got into doing podcasting. Um, and then I ended up running for the, uh, the nomination as, as you know, and, and some of the watchers may not know, um, the libertarian party actually picks our presidential and vice presidential candidates separately. So I wasn't appointed by Joe. I actually ran for the nomination. So I got that. And I've yeah. been campaigning and it feels like I've been campaigning ever since I thought I'd get some downtime <laughs> after the election. And it seems like, you know, it's, it's a little bit slower pace than it was during the campaign, but yeah, I'm pretty much still campaigning. Now I'm just campaigning for Liberty across the country, as opposed yeah. to a specific race. Well, I know that you've got, um, uh, you, your, your social media presence is excellent. I know that you, you do a really great job of boiling these ideas down into very kind of clear and digestible um, you know, uh, explanations for people to understand. I, and I know, especially like on Twitter as a medium, you got to really boil it down and you do a great job there. But oh, um, I know you, <laughs> now, now you got into the race, you were actually, uh, you were, uh, you were running alongside originally Vermin Supreme. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And yep. I know Vermin Supreme, Vermin Spike, <laughs> Vermin Spike 2020. Yeah. And per personally, like I love Vermin Supreme. Yeah, <laughs> people can yeah. say what they want. Like, um, I, you know, I know he's he's probably a little bit more kind of uh, on the left side of libertarian politics, but I love, yeah. you know, I know so many people who've gotten involved in mm -hmm. and, and really started, you know, paying attention because they saw Vermin Supreme lampooning the yeah. entire uh, political process. And, and frankly, you know, I, he, I thought he made a pretty good argument during, uh, you know, his campaign for the presidency is like, look, you know, if we're not going to win and politics has become a joke, why don't we like, you know, highlight that aspect of it and let everyone in on the joke? I thought that was actually pretty compelling. But how did you how did you become Vermin's uh, Vermin Supreme's uh, v, uh, v, uh, VP candidate in the in the During convention the nomination process, contest. in the yeah. nomination process? And then, of course, for the general election, you became the vice pre on the vice presidential uh, candidate on the ticket with Joe Jorgensen. How about how did that yeah. happen? 
So I actually first met Vermin in 2019. Uh, he actually came on my show, uh, My Fellow Americans, because I was trying to figure out what his deal was. Like I'd been following yeah. him since like 2012. I got the I got the joke. I thought it was funny. And then when he was deciding to make a serious run for the Libertarian nomination, I'm like, why? You know, you're you're you go to you know New Hampshire every four years and make a make a spectacle out of the already existing spectacle of the New Hampshire yeah. primaries and shine a light on how ridiculous the whole process is and how like silly our political discourse has become. Why are you seriously running for it? And uh, and so I had him on the show and he made a really compelling case for why yeah. he wanted to do it. And then we stayed in touch and I hung out with him when he came down to South Carolina for our convention that year. And then uh, about a week later, he and his team reached out to me and said, how would you like to be vermin supreme's proposed running me in the for the for 2020 and i went why why and they said well there's you know you guys balance each other out he's more on the on sort of a uh, i guess a left anarchist you're an anarcho-capitalist so you sort of have the whole spectrum of anarchist thought um he is you know he's the big attention getter he uses his satire to get attention then when we can get their attention you can talk to them about liberty ideas and you're good at that uh, there was the fact that he was in the North and I was in the South. So there, it would help with the, the tour schedule and things like that. And I said, listen, if you guys want me, I'd be happy to do it. So I did that. And when I was doing the nomination process, that contest, I went in, everything I do, I do it to win. Even if I don't mm -hmm. think I'm going to win, I still do it to win. So I did this to win. But I always mm -hmm. assumed that at some point, just because most people didn't know who I was, that I'd come in and I'd show different ways that we could campaign. You know, I did door knocking tours and housing projects. I went to college campuses before COVID and went and talked with students there. And I was showing like, this is how we can get liberty out there. It's not just talking to libertarians constantly. Like we can go out and talk right. to the normies basically and reach people that we often don't think are receptive to our message. Let me show you that they are receptive. Right. And I thought they would go, that's great, Spike, great job. We'll definitely adopt that. And we're going to pick Larry Sharp or whoever is our VP. And so I just kept waiting for that to happen. And then pretty much beginning of May, the, the, the actual contest was the end of May. By the end of April, beginning of May, I thought, oh, they're going to pick me. Like I was, I was like, I think they're going to, because I didn't really have at that point, uh, I didn't really have any solid competition. And I thought, Okay, so this is going to be whoever they pick and me. And sure enough, that's what happened. They picked Joe and, the, and then they yeah. picked me. And, uh, and it's been, uh, it's kind of been the same. I, like I said, it, there hasn't really been a break since the, I feel like I'm still campaigning. So it's kind of been, uh, you know, hitting the ground running ever since. Like in two days, I'm going to be in New York for a 10 day tour. And that's yeah. like a typical, what my life is like right now. So yeah, that's how that happened. You know, I can only imagine. I know, um, of course, when I ran for office the first time, I, I ran for like, you know, local state Senate race where I could go knock on yep. every door and talk with, you know, most of the people in the, in the district. Uh, you know, I do have, you know, have run for statewide office and I know that's much bigger, mm -hmm. but I, I can't imagine the first time running for office, running for a <laughs> national office where you've got to yes. crisscross across the entire country. Um, yep. How did you keep up with all that? What was that like for your, your first time running to be uh uh, running for a national office like that? Uh, it was very little sleep. I had very, very little sleep. I slept about on average about three, maybe four hours a day. Um, uh, it was interesting because someone at one point said, you're now discovering why so many politicians do cocaine. And sure enough, <laughs> I, I, I am actually, I'm 15 years sober. I'm a recovering drug addict. And there were multiple times where I thought, yeah, no, I get it. If you had to do a nationwide office, I could totally get why someone would want to do cocaine. But <laughs> by the way, don't kids at home, don't do cocaine. But the um the so all that to say, I I and we did a very we were the only nationwide, the only ticket that went nationwide the way we did. Uh Donald Trump visited a handful of states. Joe Biden basically stayed in his basement the entire time. I think he he ventured out to a couple churches during the campaign, maybe went to one or two states. But we were really the only campaign that visited, I think between the two of us, uh, Joe and I visited something like 47 or 48 states. Uh, and one of them we couldn't visit, Hawaii, because if you went there, you were stuck for like three weeks. I myself visited 35 states, and it was every day was a different state. In the last uh, month, in October, I visited an average of two states a day. And it was just constant. It was the you know the bus tour, and you know flying from location to location. Uh, uh, an average of a dozen interviews and appearances in between the different events that I was doing. Uh, two to three events a day. It was it was incredibly high paced. Very little sleep, and um, 
you know, it was, it was the most challenging, but also one of the most, pretty much the most rewarding thing, uh, I guess, second only to getting uh, married that I've ever done in my life. And certainly the most challenging, it was definitely uh, five months of, uh, of insanity. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you now, you've been, uh, you've got a, a, a breadth of experiences in the Liberty Movement. Uh, you've, yep. you've been doing this, or you've been involved in the Liberty Movement since the Ron Paul days. We're about, mm -hmm. you know, a decade out from Ron Paul's last run for president. Yep. Uh, and it, at least it seems to me that, you know, while some people perhaps discounted the Liberty Movement at the end of the Ron Paul campaign and Rand Paul's, you know, campaign for president in 2016 didn't quite materialize mm -hmm. the way some of us hoped. Some people declared the Liberty Movement over and done with, and it was time to move on and, you know, go in wh whichever, whichever other direction. But at the same time, it really does feel like, I know as we look at the what's been done with Young Americans for Liberty. We have over 170 Liberty legislators now yep. elected in state capitals across the country. There's yep. a resurgence of energy uh, in uh, among a bunch of folks in the Libertarian Party. Now I tend to focus more on Republican Party efforts, but I have tremendous respect for anyone who is fighting and advocating for liberty wherever right. they think the most effective way to do that is. Mm -hmm. As you've got your kind of finger on the pulse of the liberty movement right now, what do you see as... Um, what do you think this moment is that we're in? Do you, do you think that there is this kind of resurgence in energy that I, I seem to be seeing there? Is that is that something that you see going on? Absolutely. So the silver, typically after a, a big election, after a presidential election, there's at least a year of this lull period where people kind of just go back to normal mm -hmm. and they don't they aren't even really thinking about politics in general. The silver lining to the increasingly dystopian nightmare we're living in right now is that everyone is actually in more engaged politically than they were last year, which that's not usually what happens. Right. The, the thing is, Democrats right now are mostly pretty upset. They're not getting what they were promised. They're getting all this stuff they were told wasn't going to happen. Um, and Republicans are upset, especially the more establishment or, or you know, populist Republicans are upset. They didn't get anything that they wanted, and they're, they're kind of being let down. Really, within the Republican Party, the only people that are seeing any kind of surgence that I'm seeing uh, and success are the Liberty Republicans. And in the Libertarian Party, we're seeing record numbers. Um, there was a special election back in April. And it was a handful of local and regional races, but in multiple states around the country. The Libertarian Party won 57% of the races that we were running it. That's the first yep. time we've ever done anything like that. It was, a, it was a majority of races that we won. At every event that I'm going to, just and this is anecdotally, yeah. but I've been to 20 states this year, 25 states this year. And every event, every state I've been to, the events that I've had were bigger than the events that we had in that state last year mm. during the campaign. So, you know, from everything that I've seen and heard, the, you know, the, the fact that people are seeing that the, uh, the establishment and the status quo in this country is only going to give them more nightmare, um, it's really bringing people to the yeah. liberty movement. I, I wish it didn't take that to do it, yeah. but that is the, I guess, silver lining to all of this. And no, I, I think the liberty movement is stronger now uh, and growing than it probably ever has been in this country. You know, I, I have a theory that when you look backwards in history at some of the other past youth movements in the country. I think of like yeah. the Goldwater movement, which isn't an exact parallel. I mean, we have, you know, right. some differences in ideology mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. But the Goldwater movement, you know, in 1964, you know, yeah. when Goldwater lost in a landslide to Johnson, people would have declared yeah. the Goldwater revolution over and done with. But it was 16 years later that 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 movement that youth movement had kind of grown up and mm -hmm. the financial the financial power and the institutional power that that movement lacked because it was youth movement now was they, they had now was powerful enough to get you know Ronald Reagan into the white house and i think about when i when i think about that compared to the liberty movement today you know it's been 10 years since ron paul ran and we were a bunch of young you know, ragamuffins. <laughs> we didn't have any money. We didn't have certainly didn't have any institutional power. Yeah, we just tried yeah. to compensate with raw enthusiasm and yeah. just like willpower and hard work. And that was enough to get us far enough to, you know, win a couple a states, lot further win some than caucuses. a lot of other people thought. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We took over a few states, but at the end of the day, 
you know, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't achieve the victory we had, we had hoped, but some seeds were really planted. And I wonder now, as we see, you know, as you mentioned, you, you said liber- uh, LP folks getting elected. I, were, are those two a lot of like the local, like nonpartisan races? I know that's yes, been they a big, were, they were local, they were local, local and regional nonpartisan races. And, and here's those the are very this important. You know, a libertarian party activist and a, a liberty Republican activist, you know, this is a, a common conversation we can have between us. I believe right. that long term. I always think that you're going to get the rope a dope from the Republican Party once you rise right. to a certain point. At the same time, I acknowledge that, you know, if you're running for state rep, we've only had a handful of state reps ever win as libertarians, whereas in the Republican Party, that happens quite a bit. It's it's at that level and higher where, right. you know, at least for now, the Libertarian Party has to continue growing if we're to reach that point of doing right. that. So that's why I'm not going to give you a hard time or other people in in the, you know, the two main parties uh, a hard time that are trying to um, you know, leverage the, the right. as you said, like institutional power that those parties have. I will tell you that I do believe that, you know, at the end of the day, the leadership in both of those parties, it's essentially a uniparty system that's feeding a, a crony corporate agenda that brought them in. With all of that oh, said, a, a, if, I would say, yeah, oh, go ahead. I, I would say absolutely. It's like, you know, I Edward, actually Edward Snowden was saying something along these lines before yep. the neoliberals and the neocons who've run kind of same the establishment thing. in both parties. It's yep. it's the same. It's the same thing. It's two wings of the same the same beast. And I think that so many folks in the Republican base, in ter- terms of like a lot of the regular conservatives who I work with very often, I mean, they don't like Mitch McConnell any more than they like Hil- Hillary Clinton. Off, uh, oftentimes, they recognize it's a cor- it's a corrupt system. Yep. And I, yep. I think for for our part, you know, I consider myself liberty movement first. And then party I tell people, second, yeah. right, use yep. whatever party is the most effective vehicle to advance the cause of liberty. Maybe for some people, that's the LP. Some people, that's the GOP. Maybe someone is a liberty Democrat who can use that view. I've never met that person. That person seems to be a unicorn. Uh, I'm still <laughs> waiting to meet that liberty Democrat out there who can actually win. But uh, but ultimately, it's about the ideas. It's about the cause first, and the parties are just the vehicles that we want to use. So exactly. when if people if people can run as libertarian party candidates and win election to local office, whether that's city council or school board yeah. or a county office, I mean those are the offices that affect people's lives on a day to day basis, day basis yeah. more than anything else. And of course, yeah. you win you win a, a seat there. You come to know your constituents. They come to know you. And maybe you can make that leap to a to a, a state legislative seat or something higher from there. Uh, exactly. And and that's that's why I always tell people there's so many people who the first thing they want to do at the gate is run for Congress. And I say, no, run for state representative, <laughs> run for dog catcher, run for something right, right, right. achievable and build up from there. And I, I think yeah. I'm, I'm glad to see the LP focusing on those local races where uh, that uh, scarlet the, people aren't looking for the scarlet letter on the. Uh, on the ballot, you know, people are so programmed that they vote R or D, but when it's a local race, you vote for the person. You vote for the person. And the thing I keep saying, Eric, and and to many uh, Liberty Republicans and and people who the LP and the libertarian agenda lines up the most with what they want, but they, they don't live in a state like yours with ranked choice and they have to choose. Am I choosing libertarian party, which especially in the higher races, the likelihood is, is slim to none that they're going to win, or am I going to choose Republican party and, and, uh, or some Democrat party, uh, to, to try to fight, you know, the lesser evil or for, uh, or run as a, you know, Liberty Republican, as opposed to running as a libertarian. And here's what I say, vote however you want to vote, run however you want to run. What I'm focused on is growing this movement within this party right. so that it grows to a point where one day you don't have to choose between your principles and electability that you can say, I want to run with the L next to my name. And it's, uh, it's not a hindrance or a liability and it actually helps you. That's what my goal is. And, and yeah. the main per the main focus of that is to get people elected in you know state legislative races and down which is where that's our wheelhouse right now get them elected there yes help the congressional candidates help the gubernatorial candidates help everyone to try to get the message out there as much as possible but focus primarily on the races that we're already more and more reliably winning because from there we can grow a grassroots movement that will eventually have i'd love one day for yal to primarily be working with libertarian candidates because it's just as electable as republican candidates um yeah. not that they have to choose between one or the other but that we are included in there more and more as well because we now have the uh the infrastructure in place to be able to contend for those higher races 
Yeah. And I know it's been, uh, and I should say, you know, for those watching that Young Americans for Liberty is a nonpartisan organization. Yes. When yep. we endorse candidates, we don't look, um, we look for two things. We look at, are they principled? And we've thoroughly yep. vet every candidate. Yep. We have an extensive survey and we interview them. And we really try to get at what the principles are and make mm -hmm. sure that they are in alignment with the principles of liberty as articulated yep. by Ron Paul. And then the second question we ask is, do they have a path to victory? And we've, we've endorsed uh, a, a good handful of Libertarian mm -hmm. Party candidates yep. for state representative. I, I think we like to brag. We, we, we've spent more money on uh, LP candidates than any other organization in the country, including the Libertarian Party. Uh, as, but, but you're right. It is, it is hard for people to overcome when there's both a Democrat and a Republican in the race that, yep. that yep. sense that voters have of you know, you know, it's the, the way the system is, is, yeah. is built, right? It's the first past the post plurality system. People are like, mm -hmm. well, I might agree with this Libertarian Party candidate more, but I really don't like that Democrat. And I don't want the, that person to get in. So I'm going to vote for the Republican. And you have the lesser exactly. of two evils a problem. Yep. So I know most of the candidates we've, we've been successful in getting elected have run as Republicans. But of course, that's not that's not a rule across the board. You have Marshall hmm. Burt, who got elected in Wyoming. Now, he was fortunate in that there was no Republican in the race, so he got to have a straight head-to-head -head against the Democrat as a Libertarian Party candidate, and that worked out well for him, and he's doing a good mm -hmm. job there in Wyoming. Um, yep. but, but I guess back to kind of the original point we were on was that the Liberty Movement does seem to be growing, whether it's through these LP candidates getting elected to local offices or candidates getting elected to state legislative offices, there's mm -hmm. institutional power growing in the liberty movement as far as elected offices. And then, you know, I, I always go back to, you know, Ron Paul told, you know, told, uh, you know, us to try to end the Fed. And then there's a whole bunch of folks who eschewed politics completely and said they're going to go try to found a parallel financial system called Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Yeah. And now it's like they might actually end the Fed. And it turns out a lot of people in the liberty movement because of that might have some of the financial power that is needed to overturn an establishment. So I am increasingly optimistic about where we're going as long yeah. as we've got good, you know, good people taking the charge, fighting every day. And that, that enthusiasm and that love of liberty doesn't, uh, doesn't die out in people's hearts because we've been going through some some pretty challenging times, uh, especially over the last two years. But let me ask you where, where we are today. What are some of the most important issues that you see out there right now that you think the liberty movement is in a uh, is is in a the best position to 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 uh, to speak out against and on? We we are watching something that hasn't happened in this country in over a century where the government and popular culture and media is basically trying to create a two-tiered society. Mm. And it's not, you know, the, the cleanest line that they're trying to divide it along is vaccinated versus unvaccinated. But honestly, that's not the, the, that's not the actual line they want to draw. That's the easiest and clearest line that they're drawing. Right. But the real line that they are drawing is those who will look at the emperor and say, what a beautiful cloak that you have on. And those who will look at the emperor and say, you're completely naked, put some clothes on. And what's happening right now is they are presenting us with increasingly nonsensical information about COVID and how to deal with it. They're still trying to tell us that this is some temporary thing. And if we'll just accept whatever, you know, police state nonsense they want to impose temporarily, that COVID will magically go away, even though every bit of data that we have shows us this is endemic, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and there's, you know, at this point, right. uh, until we have a point where we can do gene therapy and, and actually modify our genes where we're no longer susceptible to these types of viruses, the vaccine's not making it go away. The COVID waves are going to be just as permanent as cold and flu season are. And we need to now have a conversation about, is this how we want to live? Is you know, you have to get a booster shot every three to six months or you're not allowed to go anywhere. Is that how we want to live? Is, you know, you have to wear, a, a, your kids have to wear a mask uh, indoors for the rest of their lives, even in school, how we want to live. Is, is this the way that we want to function, not even temporarily, but forever? And an increasing number of people, even people that consider themselves on the left are saying, no, if this is if this is for good, then no, I don't want to live that way, which is why they're constantly trying to sell it as, well, just one more thing, just one more thing. Right. And I think that that is just the two biggest weeks to flatten issue. The curve. 
two weeks to flatten the curve. And there are still people going, we're just trying to flatten the curve. And it's like, we've had multiple curves. They flatten on their own. They come up every couple months. They last for about a month or so. And then they come back down. This is how they're going. This is the viral patterns that come with each new mutation. And each uh, with each new mutation, the the vaccines are that much less effective. Like this is literally cold and flu season, just with a different type of pattern, because it's not really affected by seasonality as much. But, you know, what we're seeing is that all of these interventions that have been done did not actually do anything to stop stop or slow COVID, which means they're not going to work in the future either. All they did is create the mess that we're seeing now with the supply chain and with the labor uh, labor shortage and everything else, where the government here and around the governments around the world were playing red light, green light with the economy. And all of this boils down to the same thing. They are creating a reality where if you are someone who believes all evidence to the contrary, be damned, that the people who are in charge are good and smart people who know better than us, and we simply have to do whatever they say whenever they say so, then you're one of the good people. You're going to be treated well. You're going to be called a good person. You're going to be allowed to go to the gym. You're going to be allowed to go to a restaurant. If you're one of the bad people who says, no, these people are idiots and liars, and I think that I can make better decisions, and we in our communities can make better decisions than these people can from you know their, their mountaintop centrally planning everything, you're a bad person. You're going to be labeled as bad. Everything you say is going to be considered disinformation. You're going to get blackballed from social media. You're not going to be allowed to speak to more than a handful of of people at a time. You're not going to be able to have any kind of platform to speak from. And no, you're not going to be allowed in a restaurant or a gym or coming soon, a grocery store. Your children won't be allowed in school. And this is the new kind of division they're creating. The opportunity, because uh, as our as our betters tell us, never let a crisis go to waste. The opportunity here is that there is a gro- record and growing number of people here and really around the world who are recognizing this for what it is because they're moving too fast. The 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 if we use the frog in the boiling pot analogy, they're turning it up just a little too fast, and enough people are saying wait a second, this isn't going to work. And, and more and more people are recognizing that it's also not temporary. A lot of people are willing to tolerate things if they think it's temporary right. and necessary. And they're seeing it's not necessary, it didn't work, and it's not temporary. The liberty movement needs to talk and connect with people that we usually wouldn't talk or connect to, people who are not there with us on the libertarian spectrum, but who recognize this is wrong. And we need to meet them where they are, in their spaces and from their precepts, right. validate their concerns, and then we can start that process of showing them how we got right. here, showing them how liberty works, and walking them over fully to all right. of us. You know, not not just that the lockdowns are bad, that the vaccine mandates are bad, that these things are bad, but that it's because of the Federal Reserve that they can do this. It's because of the centrally planned regulations that they can do this. But you you have to start by meeting them where they are, and then you can walk them over towards sort of the pipeline, the anti uh, anti new world order or anti vaccine mandate pipeline to libertarianism. And that's, that's our major challenge. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm going around the, the country yeah. doing. I really like that. I, and I've always thought of it as you got to meet people where they are and then challenge yep. them to go further. But yes, you know, sometimes I see people in the Liberty movement who will get angry with anyone who isn't, <laughs> who isn't there yet. But I guess I just right. think, geez, I remember when I wasn't there yet. And I remember, I always, uh, I always think of my older brother who was like the first uh, Ron Paul supporter in my family who would just mock me and make fun of me for being a George W. Bush supporter. <laughs> and I was like, looking back on it, that wasn't the most persuasive way <laughs> to get me on board. Um, you know, we, we gotta, uh, you know, we gotta meet people where they are, recognize yep. where they are. And I, and I, I've got to say, and I imagine perhaps this is somewhat true for you. For me, it feels like. So much of the playbook that we're seeing used with the COVID regime today is mm. so much the playbook that we all saw with the war on terror 20 years ago. Yeah. Oh, this is a temporary intervention. This is going to be an easy walk in the park. We're going to go into Iraq and it's going to, you know, ep- you know, but the yep. wars, of course, we found out were never designed to end. There was never an exit strategy. They were designed to be permanent. It was designed to be a continual uh, cash grab and power grab for, you know, for uh, elite, you know, for establishment institutions. Yeah. And that's, you know, I feel like having figured that all out, having gone through the, the war on terror era, era, believing it, and then finally breaking free of the matrix. Once you've seen that playbook, you can see it 
being played all over again. And you just want to shake your fellow Americans and say, wake up. How, how are you not seeing this yet? How are you falling yep. for this again? Yep. And, and this is the warning that I have. And I give this to libertarians too, because I've seen a lot of libertarians who they're seeing what the Democrats are doing and how they're contributing to this. They're, basically, you have the establishment status quo in, in America, the political establishment, Republican and Democrat, that are working together to create the conditions for you know, going back to like the USSR, worst periods of the USSR, where you had neighbors snitching on each other in desperation yeah. to get food rations to keep Stalinistic uh, police state going, or what we see now with the Chinese social credit system. And and most of us as libertarians, almost all of us are recognizing what the Democrats are doing with vaccine mandates, with the pushes on social media to basically requiring social media to fact check us and to, to you know, block us for misinformation and things like that. But some of us aren't spotting what's happening on the GOP side. And here's the biggest thing. Right now mm. in Texas, there's a bill called SB8, which is ostensibly an abortion ban. I'm not going to get into an abortion debate with people because I've been on both sides of the argument. I know all the arguments. This really isn't about abortion. SB8 seeks to actually, it doesn't challenge the constitutionality of Roe v. Wade. It claims to completely bypass the question of constitutionality by employing snitches and the civil court system instead of police and the criminal justice system. And if this were to actually succeed, if the Supreme Court, I don't think it will, but if the Supreme Court looks at this and goes, well, I guess you got us, you're not using the criminal justice system, so we can't rule that this is unconstitutional, instantly. Any politician who wants to pass an, pass an otherwise unconstitutional law, and you can fill in the blank, ban on all guns, ban on certain types of speech, ban on certain types of religion, pretty much you know, put in whatever you want that would otherwise be unconstitutional. But instead of using the police, we're going to use incentivized snitches and the civil court system. That coupled with what the Democrats are doing with the vaccine mandates and passports, the lockdown regimes and everything else, they are creating on both sides, while we're busy fighting each other, Republicans and Democrats and, and people on the left and right are fighting each other. They are working together from the sidelines to come together and create the three conditions that are needed for an authoritarian police state. The government to have absolutely zero structural limitations stopping them from doing to you whatever they want to mm -hmm. do, and that's coming with the vaccine mandates and with this incentivized snitching. A large enough population of people who are more than happy to snitch on their neighbors in order to benefit even remotely. How does $10,000 a pop sound to you? Because that's what SB8 has. And honestly, mm -hmm. they can make that whatever amount they want. And more importantly, a divided country who cares more about fighting against the person over there than they do against fighting against the people that are subjugating all of us. Unfortunately, we already have that. We're already pretty yeah. well divided. But imagine now if I go, oh, you're going to sue me for owning a gun? Well, I'm going to sue you for smoking a cigarette. Just imagine what is being created here, which is why I yeah. ask libertarians, including pro-life libertarians, look at SB8 the same way that you're looking at the vaccine mandates. Even if you believe that uh, abortion should be criminalized in some way, this isn't the way to do it because this is not going to mm. end with abortion. They will use this in the same way that I tell people on the left. Even if you support everyone getting vaccinated, this is not the way to do it. In both cases, government is doing what they always do. They're using a boogeyman or a pretext to push for more power. And if we allow them to do it, we're going to get a dystopian authoritarian police state, the likes of which many of us, even in the midst of all of this, don't really think is possible. Look at Australia. Look at how quickly that happened over there. It can happen quickly here. Look at what's happened in the last two years. If you don't think it can accelerate further, look at the last two years. It can get really bad. We have to fight all of this stuff. And we have to unify with others who will agree with us on even just that one thing even just opposing SBA, even just opposing the vaccine right. mandates, even just fighting for Second Amendment rights, whatever that thing is, we need to make allies, we need to make friends, we don't need to judge them for the fact they agree, disagree with us on even any everything else. Let's work together on what we can. Right. And in doing so, let's bring them into our better ideas. Let's make those relationships so we can affect them and bring them in. And we can grow this movement and actually turn things around. You know, I think that one of the lessons that's often forgotten about the example that Ron Paul uh, set during his time in Congress and why he was effective in, 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 his, you know, in his own way was that he was a coalition builder. He yep. was very principled. Mm -hmm. he, he took a stand. He didn't waffle on anything. Nope. 
but he was also willing to build coalitions with anyone who would stand with him on any issue, be that Dennis Kucinich against yep. the wars who, I mean, what do Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich have in common, except maybe against the wars and against the surveillance state and these sorts of things e- on economics it. and healthcare and everything. They're miles and miles apart, but that yep. doesn't matter when you're fighting against the wars. When, you, when you've got such an important issue in front of you, you take the allies you can get. You don't look exactly. a gift horse in the mouth and maybe even in working together, maybe even, you know, maybe even, you know, bring them an inch or two your way on some exactly. other things. Yeah. I know some of the best, you know, when I was in the state legislature, some of the best coalitions, because when I was in the state legislature, you had Republicans in control of the Senate, Democrats in control of the House, and like nothing was getting done except for where we were able to kind of coalition build on principled issues like gun rights and surveillance and medical marijuana. We were mm-hmm. able to build coalitions who, with people who disagreed with us on 80% of the time, and yeah. you advance that. You may disagree on 80% of things, but let's work together on the 20% where we agree and let's make advancements there. And, um, it, and it, you can also, can, and, and right. I'm sorry, in doing so, we can bring them in. Our ideas make so much more sense than anyone else's. We have better ways of dealing with things like free speech and the Second Amendment and yeah. economic issues than anything that the, the, at least the establishment Republicans, I'll go ahead and say the Republicans in general, but certainly the non-liberty Republicans even pretend to believe in. And we have far better ideas for criminal justice and health care and the wars that, than anything the Democrats are pretending to say. So why the hell are we arguing with people right. if we already have things that we agree with people on? Okay, If people on the left, we already agree with them on criminal justice issues, or at least many of the criminal justice issues, and we already agree with them on other issues you know, like ending the wars, or we already agree with them on issues like ending the war on drugs, and if we agree with people on the right about things like Second Amendment issues and possibly also criminal justice issues, possibly also ending the war on drugs, an increasing number of people on the right are, are in favor of ending the war on drugs, if only for economic reasons. Yeah. If we can agree with them on those things and work specifically on those things, And in doing so, we consistently, gently and lovingly remind them on how, you know, that thing we disagree on, that's us being consistent about the thing we agree on, but also with this, right? You can almost rib them a little on it. Once you have that working relationship, they're going to see it more and more, and you're planting those seeds. And it's a lot easier for someone to discount your ideas if you're constantly arguing with them. They can go, oh, they mm-hmm. just disagree with everything I say. But if you're already working with them on something and you keep saying things that just make more sense than anything anyone else is saying about that subject, inevitably they're going to come over to your side more and more. Maybe not 100%, but frankly, there's a lot of libertarians that still aren't at 100%. We can't even agree on what 100% is, right? So if we can get them in 70, 80, 90%, yeah. whatever I don't even, even agree with I don't even agree with myself 100% of the time. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes I, I change my mind on twice things, today. you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. If we can do that, um, we bring them in and we're going to have a bigger movement. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I and I think sometimes the uh, you know, we can get caught up in all these purity tests so much when really we we need to just be looking at bringing people in and take them take them for where they are and challenge them to move mm-hmm. to move forward. Absolutely. Now, I I will say, and of course, and of course, I, you know, I advocate for more of a Republican strategy and you advocate for more of an LP strategy, which I, which I completely respect. And I say, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, anyone who disagrees with me on the best strategy, just go out and do it. And if you're good at it, follow and may the best, Mm -hmm. may the best strategy win. Um, You know, if we agree on the ideas and the principles, that's what's important and strategy, we can, we can agree to disagree and we can wish each other well and, and, um, and, you know, I I want everyone who believes in in liberty to to succeed in in what they're doing. I will say, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the, you know, you know, getting to something you were talking about before, I think one of the dangers always is, you know, I think there's a big opportunity for the Republican Party right now and that, you know, the, um, the Democrat Party is going way overboard. Biden is unpopular, and there could be a swing back to the Republican Party. But if all that happens is we put the party of Mitt Romney and Mitch McConnell and Liz Cheney, if all we're doing is putting uh-huh. them back in charge, we're not any better off nope. than we than that. No, it's it's the you know for the Republican Party to be worth anything, it's got to change. The old establishment has to be thrown out. We cannot have this 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 old neoconservative party. You know, yeah. 
it's like I got involved in the GOP to change the party. So many of from the Ron Paul movement who are pursuing the GOP strategy got into mm-hmm. change things. And of course, yep. the danger is if it doesn't change and it's just the old guard establishment, you know. Um, but of course, this is this is this is the false choice that they have given us for so long. This is how yep. the establishment has rigged the game. They don't need to stuff the ballot boxes when they've got basically the same two people as the nominees for both parties. Exactly. When they just the only thing that they disagree is w- whether the tax rate should be, you know, 34 percent or 37 percent. It's yeah. it's like Tom Woods calls the three by five card of allowable opinion. If we're just mm-hmm. in this very narrow box of, you know, we should be bombing this country or that country, we should be inflating this much or that much rather than why do we have a, cent- a central banking system, a Federal Reserve banking system that is begin valuing the yeah. currency and stealing from us? Why are we why do we have this empire that is fighting multiple wars in multiple countries all at once? If yeah. all we are doing is going back to that narrow three by five card of allowable difference, then you, we might as well just give up the game and say it's not worth it. It's, it's not enough just to elect Republicans. It's not enough. You know, we got to elect people who believe in liberty, whatever exactly. party they're in. Exactly. Exactly. That this is the uh, the rope. I call it the wasted vote. You know, people say, I feel like I'm wasting a vote if I vote third party. A wasted vote is voting for anyone. I don't care which party, what party they run as a Republican, Democrat, anyone who is a part of the mess that has been created and has contributed to that mess being created. And they show up and have the gall to tell you yet again, hey, guys, it's me again. I know I created this mess that you're in or helped create it. But if you don't vote for me, you're going to get that guy over there that I've been working with to create this mess. Like, that's the biggest. It's a scam. It's a con. And it's certainly a waste of a vote. If we are not putting in people in office, and, and I'm on the same, you know, on the opposite side of it, but in the same place as you, if someone says to me, I want to run as a, as a Liberty Republican or a Liberty Democrat, or I'm going to run as a, as a, you know, an independent, not have a party next to me. Good. Go do it. Do a great job at it. Do such a great job at it that you convince me that's the best way to do it. Like, you know, we believe in a marketplace of ideas, right? right? Go, go do it. Shine as best as you can. And we can figure out what works best. It's more than likely a, a many different strategies that are going to get us there. But with all of that said, you know, don't let it change you. Don't if you find yourself reaching a point where it's like, well, yeah, yeah, but we got to make sure that the Republicans or the Democrats or whoever, that they get in, then we can start working on the liberty stuff. I got news for you, folks. That's been going on right. for decades. That's the thing that, oh, yeah, no, we'll do that next time. But this is the most important election of our lifetimes. And we need, you know, turd sandwich yeah. to beat, uh, you know, giant douchebag or whatever it was from uh from South, from South Park, Park. We, we, we have to do that <laughs> yeah. just in this election. Four years from now, we're totally going to nail it with the Liberty thing. They've been telling us that for decades. They've been saying that be- before me and, er- and Eric were even born. That's been going on for decades. That ain't going to happen. You yeah. have to stand firm. If you're doing it, changing the GOP or, or the Democrats from the inside, great, do that. But stick to your guns on it. Stick yeah. to your guns on these are my hills that I'm going to die on. And if, if, you're not, if we can't do these here, then we'll do it elsewhere. Um, and that's why I'm in the LP because I would rather fight the uphill battle of electability than fight right. the uphill battle of trying to change an existing system. But if you would rather do the other, do it and do it well. You know, work with people like Eric who are doing it. Frankly, work with me. I'd be happy to help some of y'all. I mean, I, I'm I am primarily an LP uh, partisan, but you know, I'm going to work with anyone who wants to spread liberty. I mean, it's, it's just too important, man. Like we, I, I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and be like, well, at least I never worked with any Republicans while we're in the gulag. Like I, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Well, and, and how many times are we going to be Charlie Brown with Lucy in the football? You know, they, yes. they got the football there. Say, this is the time we're not pulling that football away. And you know, then you're on your back and you've fallen for it again. Um, yeah. But yeah, well, Anthony, no, it's- Anthony Fauci has been uh, Lucy with the football with uh, <laughs> with the, you know, two weeks to, to slow the slow the curve. And then it turns yeah. out Lucy's been torturing Snoopy. Um, this is and you know, I mean, this is the world we live in now. Like yeah. this, these are the and, and, and we're told that this person is the hero. And, and this is the man who, you know, if, if I may Fauci bout bash for a second. This is the man who's created the gay panic in the 80s over AIDS by spreading the same kind of, of, of alarmism about AIDS that he was spreading about COVID this time last year and creating the same kind of panic uh, back mm-hmm. in the 80s. This is the man who increasingly, it looks like, was funding gain-of-function research in Wuhan, China. 
Um, this is a man who, you know, apparently whatever it takes to scare people into doing whatever it is he wants, he'll do it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's stunning to me and we're getting toward, we're at the end of the hour. So I'm going to give you the last word in a moment, but it's just kind of stunning to me that here we are. Fauci has been caught lying time and again about, about the, the, about the masks. And he's kind of reversed himself all over the place about gain of function in Wuhan. And what's stunning to me is, look, I don't know if the virus came from the lab in Wuhan or not. I don't know, don't know if it came from the gain know. of function research that was being done there. But what know. I do know is one, Anthony Fauci has been totally dishonest with the American people mm-hmm. every step along the way. And two, if he tells us that it didn't come from the gain of function research in Wuhan that he himself authorized in his funding, it seems like he's got a real big conflict of interest there. Why? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you better say that it didn't come from the gain of function research that you were funding, because if it did, then you're like a mass murderer. You're and a mass murderer. then, uh, of course, you would tell us that. So it's like I kind of want to I kind of want a second opinion here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I don't I don't think I'm crazy to want one. And I think that uh, those who um, just take his word for it are are uh, are, are are being fools. But yeah. I'm going to give uh, well, you the last word because we're, we're well, at the end of the hour. I was basically just going to say, especially after this last year, I think the only way that you can continue to look at not just Fauci, because Fauci is really just one person, look at this system and say, yes, these people know what's best and want only the best for us. It really requires you either not paying attention or only listening to corporate media. Although, honestly, even if you watch corporate media, if you look between the lines and remember what they said a week or a month before, you can you can kind of see the trend line even there. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the reality of central planning. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is something we need to be saying to people. Even if the people who were in charge of had th- that have this much power under these few hands, were the most brilliant and angelic people among us, completely above reproach and completely without, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, wrong thought, they still couldn't possibly know what every single one of us needs as best as we do. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for anyone to be able to keep track of the needs of hundreds of millions of people in this country, let alone the billions of people across the planet. And we know that this kind of power doesn't attract angelic geniuses. It attracts Mm. Joe Biden and Donald Trump. It attracts the most narcissistic and and greed-driven and and sociopathic and often not very bright people. And and it's not even just Trump and Biden, Hillary Clinton, Mitt Romney. These are all the people. These are the villains. It attracts the villains. And the villains are put in there and bankrolled by the corporate cronies, the the Jeff Bezoses and the Mark Zuckerbergs and the, you know, name your corporate villain there, the George Soroses and everyone else. And they put them in and they use that power to impose themselves on you and make your life harder for the most base and disgusting of reasons to enrich themselves and the people that put them in office. Right. So if there was ever any doubt that central planning is not the way these last two years, I trust will have disabused you of it. And if you meet people who still haven't quite made that connection yet where they are, it isn't going to take much to bring them over to seeing that this isn't just a problem of criminal justice reform. This isn't just a problem of police brutality. This isn't just a problem of vaccine mandates. This isn't just a problem of lockdowns or whatever the thing is that they're upset about that we agree with them on. It's the entire system is based on having too much power in the hands of too few people. And what is the liberty movement, if not a movement to take all of that power and freedom and money and decision and making ability that they have worked together to rob you of and dismantling what they have built and putting it back in your hands where it always damn well belong. That's what we're fighting for. Every single day, however you do it, make that your fight. This isn't about growing a party, the Libertarian Party, the Republican Party. This isn't about growing any party. This isn't even about individual candidates. This is about a movement that will liberate us from the monsters who try to control us. And to whatever extent you are doing that, I'm glad to be in this fight with you. And I'm glad to be in this fight with you, Eric. And and I'm, I'm really happy to have been on here. And let's just keep fighting for liberty. Well, I really appreciate it, Spike. You know, I often say, kind of to just to recap what you said there this system it's a self-selecting system those who love power tend to run for office while those of us who love liberty tend to run for the hills yes and 
if we let that trend continue, we should not be surprised when power hungry people are the ones ruling over us. We need yep. to go against our instincts. We need to run for office. We need to take <laughs> the power back. We need to restore yep. it and return it to the people. And I commend yep. you for running and for doing what you're doing. And Spike, where can people find out more about you and follow you on social media? Well, first I want to add, so when they run for power and we run for the hills, Ruby Ridge happens. We can't escape them. We can only go and fight them. We, we can't run away from the Jabberwocky. We have to face it yeah. and we can win. When we face we, it, we will win. We got to fight them over there. We got to fight them over <laughs> we here. We got to fight them over so there. We don't have to fight the them. State that finally is Washington, true. It's so we finally don't have to fight true. Them over here. It's finally true. You're, and you're either with us or against us. No, it's <laughs> finally everything we were taught in neocon school is coming true. We have to fight them over there before we have to fight them over here. So uh, if you want to follow me, uh, I'm Spike Cohen on all social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. I'm on TikTok now for the kids. I know the kids love TikTok. Um, so I'm on that now. I tried can, that for uh, a moment. It didn't work out. <laughs> I have a, I can't I have figure kids. it out. I have kids doing my TikToks, so that's I'm on TikTok <laughs> with the kids for the kids. Um, but so uh, and also I am doing events across the country. Uh, go to spikecohen.com and you can follow where I am and come out and see me. I'd love to get to meet you and answer any questions you have and and, and hang out. Um, I also have two podcasts, uh, The Muddy Waters of Freedom and My Fellow Americans. Those are both on Muddied Waters Media. You can find us on all social media platforms and on all podcasting platforms. All of our episodes are also on muddiedwatersmedia.com. Awesome, Spike. Thank you so much for joining us. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. This has been a special video episode of Free America Now, broadcasting on Yal's social media platforms. But the audio version, of course, is available on our podcast stream, Free America Now, on all your favorite podcasting apps. If you have not yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? Click the subscribe button so you get that ping on your phone every single day, Monday through Friday, as we release new episodes. Furthermore, my opinion is the Federal Reserve should be destroyed. Thank you all very much. <laughs>